Who? Oh, 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 yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey. Hey. Uh, and I'm definitely not a historian of pinball or anything. I think they asked me to give this talk just because I'm probably the oldest guy in the group. Right? Yeah. I guess you know, uh, you're automatically nominated. <laughs> yeah, you got nominated. You know, who's the oldest? Okay, you can be the guy. Uh, and I hadn't done a lot, but I've seen. Uh, when I got into this, I got in a hobby in 1975. So I've been in, doing it a long time. Uh, set up a gamer, and like most of us get started, you set up a gamer, get a machine or whatever. And uh, I was lucky because I wasn't into pinball before that. I didn't grow up playing them. I had other bad habits. We're not, we don't want to get into all those, but uh, we'll stop with that. Nah, that weren't bad. That shooting pool was and what it was. So. Uh, so we got a pool table and did that, and we got a jukebox to listen to old songs on them. And when we got the jukebox from was actually my wife's cousin, and he had a pinball machine there. And we went to get the jukebox, and she played the pinball machine. She said that would be nice to have a pinball machine in the game. So all this is blamed on my wife. Yeah. So all this addiction and things. But uh, so that's how we got our first one because my wife she. She had finally got a good combat. She says, yes, I'd still like to have only one. Uh, <laughs> and she does have her one. Her favorite is 8-Ball Deluxe. So. But uh, the rest of mine is, is definitely... <laughs> I, I have more than one now. Uh, four? Yeah, I think I'm up to four. Acres? <laughs> four hundred? <laughs> uh, my current collection right now, I think I have... Last time I counted, and it varies daily. I mean, you know, we still are collecting. Uh, I had 200 and fits, you know, yeah, 261 pinball machines and 100 other games. Uh, over the years, I've gone through a twice that many that I've bought, sold, traded, and everything else. So, I'm, and I'm constantly buying, selling, and trading. It happens all the time. Yeah. A couple trades going on from the show, people. Hey, I'll trade you this and what you got, you know. So we always doing this. But when I got into this back in, uh, say, that was in 75, I started looking around. There was a lot of neat books around. And a guy, to me, the true historian was a couple of people. Dick Mushan was one. Uh, so he, sorry, he's passed away a couple of years ago. But he was a historian who actually went out and went through libraries and things and went through the microfilm of billboard magazines and all the trade magazine looking up and identifying all the different pinball machines and looking through ads and finding them coming up lists. Uh, and he wrote the Encyclopedia of Pinball. He got volume one done, volume two, and then he never finished the rest of them. They had, and that really, that just covered the early 30s. But he, that covers, that was a neat thing to read if you like reading about history of the companies that started at the time and all the interaction between who was doing this, who stole what idea from who, and they moved around and just, uh, you know, there's, it turns out it seemed like there was a lot of uh, company espionage between the, all the pinball machines and a lot of lawsuits filed, who copied what and all this other stuff. It's kind of neat. The other was a neat thing to have is the pinball collector's resource. It's one where it, it has a list of all the pinball machines ever made. And it's from the early 30s up through current date. I think the, that is the, I don't know, about 2010 or something, they re-released another one. That, actually, two guys that did that out in California, and that was their thesis for their master's degree in college, is doing the research on the history of pinball and stuff. So my, my thesis in college wasn't that much fun. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't remember mine, but if you put those the song, you hit another next, you know, uh, some others that are around, these are just things that came around, uh, some other things, the top two are a guy named Terry Cummings out of uh, Canada, does quite a bit, and he used to recolorize flower, flowers, 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 <coughs> flowers, 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 them all flowers. Tilt was a little thing done for a art show up in Dallas. The lawn on the left, Tilt on the right with a little helping book by the guy who used to run for the company for amusement only out in California. He's retired and moved to Mexico. So 
uh, I should be moving somewhere, I don't know, but, but uh, these are all neat books. You can next, then them on. And these are some of the other famous pinball, that uh, Roger Short pinball, but Roger is still involved in all this, and uh, he's one part of it fixing that a whole new game. So I always thought his book was, kind of, to me, it was the least interesting of all these. Roger Fusser. <laughs> It looked like he showed a lot of pictures of pinball machines in Europe. I figured he made a great vacation and wrote it all off. <laughs> but I always go ask him that. But, uh, uh, far on the right is uh, Pinball by Gary Flower out of England. All about pinball. Those are, those are the famous ones from the mid 70s. Uh, they were just early. Neat to read. They all of them have a little historical section in them. They all say about the same thing. It's just that uh, I don't know why I get hung up on looking through all these. And what do you? I look at the pictures more and I read the articles. So, uh, yeah, some some other magazine I do that too. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, Joe, go next. What do you say? And these are actually uh, about three or four years ago. There's a lot of new books came out. Uh, the guy from. Uh, all of them came from Australia. They always just produced these and have done some neat books on um, just showing pictures and the history of the uh, pinball machines again. And uh, hopefully they'll get to them all. But there's a lot, a lot of neat books out there. Of course, everybody today, they want them on here. I don't know if they uploaded any of these up to the, uh, your Kindle or not, or your, your <laughs> where you get them online, I, I have no idea. Uh, I'm still a book person. I like something. I like the touch and feel. Anyway. Uh, I'm not the only one. Are we talking about people now? What kind of conference is this? Just eat your Next, let's go. Next. I mean, there's there are more books than you, you you know. You bought every book, you're going to spend a, a lot of money on all of them. So there's lots of these, all those last two slides that just came out in the last five years. So they're really uh, neat. And they came from people in Australia and Europe. So I don't know if they have better access to publishing to get them published or not. I don't know why all of a sudden they, were, they had a flush of them. Next. More. Hey, well, what's top here? Uh, uh, one of them is. One thing, you know, there's a, there's a book about Valley Bingo games. There's actually a book just for that to show all of them. There's a Mad Dog in his, his art. Uh, I think Mr. Gene Cunningham actually had to produce this one. Uh, and it talked about Dave Christensen and all his artwork. He was a famous artist that did a lot of pinball machines that old guys like. Uh, and he was famous for three things is what family on the playing area is famous are boobs, <laughs> belt buckles, and so what, three at once. But three B's, yeah, three B's. What's those three B's? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <Right? laughs> uh, no. uh, Thank you coming, Mike. Long, that's a trap. Come on, Long. Uh, no. no. uh, uh, I'm almost forgetting about it. We're going to be fine. <laughs> Well, no, I'll go back. Well, also, there's a book about pinball machines for Italy. And uh, one thing I found interesting about that, when they uh, did it, pinball machines going to Italy, they had to be reprinted on things. They could not flip or pin uh, pinball machine became illegal in Italy, and they call them, they call them, or they call them in Europe, and it, they call them flipper machines. They call them flipper games. So, Italy outlawed flipper games. So they removed the word flipper off of all the pinball machines that went to Italy. I told you that got by the law. I, I have no idea uh, what, you know. What's, what's the Japanese book up there? The Japanese book was just one that, uh, well, that's easy. He no, he can't it. read it. I can't <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's but, uh, pinball pictures. gravity or something. Yeah, it's uh, good out, you didn't tell about the history of pinball. I'm all about the history, yeah. but it, it has long graffiti. <laughs> pinball graffiti. <laughs> That's yeah. a lot. Graffiti. Uh, a lot of these pictures on that the, the show in uh, 
Chicago, we used to go to it just about every year. And there's a group when uh, Sega got involved in producing the pinball machines, they bought out Stern. They, uh, uh, there's a group from Japan, a group of guys came over to that show every year. And they published, it. I don't know if they published the book or who published the book. Uh, I still don't know the author, I can't read anything, but I, I can look through and look at the picture. So. <laughs> but it's kind of neat. Uh, and again, it's true, you read it from back to front. <laughs> which is going to close you out the first time you go. <laughs> so it's all kind of weird. Uh, now we'll go a more from the next one. Uh, you got a list of, uh, uh, I gave you of all the things, and it tells you kind of a little bit about the history of pinball, and I'm going to just kind of touch through and show some pictures of some of the games I have. Uh, and both of them. Jason, don't pay attention to me. Okay. You got it. Am I walking around? The speaker. <laughs> That's all I could hear. Uh, I, I just hear a noise from that <laughs> From this side of the speaker, because it's baffled on the back yeah, side. We can so. close that door. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, we have a back door. <laughs> I think you should take care of it, though. <laughs> on the uh, the handout, it first says most people think that Baffle Ball and Bally Who was the first pinball machines, but they really weren't the first pinball machines. They made pinball for a couple of years before that, and other big companies made them. Wiffle was one of the first one that uh, they added the mainly you know, added a coin sheet. The first thing they had games that were pinball games but they were not under glass they didn't have a coin sheet you just played them and of course it was easy to adjust your score and yeah. you could reach in and grab the ball while you shot but well, most of them were kind of like they called bag of tail games you just shot a ball and it bounced around some pins and fell in a hole and you'd count up your score at the end but until they put that under glass and put a coin sheet on it so people couldn't affect their score or do it uh, then that's when they started calling them pinball machines. And they really were just called trade stimulators before that, until in, uh, one of the magazine writers in 31 or 32 started calling, calling the phrase pinball, just because that's what it was. It was a play field with a whole bunch of pins and they shot little metal balls around it. So far cry from what we look like today. So Wiffle was one and it was, uh, this wooden thing, wooden little nail pins on it, and you go to the next slide. You know, this is what the play field looked like for Wiffle. But again, a whole bunch of pins or nails in it, and the ball would bounce around and, uh, and do it. And then in a hole, and you had to, had to know a little bit of math, you had to add up to your own score. So, we go next, and we just go and bounce through. And this was a uh, one that really they considered the first pin of. Uh, commercial pinball machine with a corn op in it was the uh, Mills official pin pin table, what it was called. <clears throat> and it's a very you know, no, but it's very small. It's only about a foot by two foot long. Well, Wiffle was a little bigger. Next, and this is a five star final. Of the oh, the store behind this, Gottlieb had made Ballyhoo and made lots of money and things, made a couple of others. Then they made five star final because Mr. Goblin thought pinball was not going to last and this would probably be the final pinball machines they made. <laughs> and they named it five star final. And that's the, the story you got from the book for that. But it, it's interesting, back in the, the 30s they did a lot of different things. This one here, the ball loops around the play field and does a circle eight in it for it to, to travel. So it loops around and it makes a circle eight and then falls into the pin. So, and it's, other than that, it's about the regular size of a pinball machine. I mean, it's the, the play field. It's a little bit smaller, but it's about that. You hit next again. Okay. This is one called uh, uh, Baby Leland. I gotta remember all uh, And it has two little horseshoes. You shoot the ball in and the ball loops through those two little horseshoes. And it's a fun game. You can sit and bet beer. I mean, bet uh, 
Uh, play it. No, no game like that. Uh, yeah. Right over there. Right over there. Yeah. We sat here and I ended up show this show several years ago, and a few of us sat around and played that thing for high school forever. And it's real small. It's only about a foot by two foot, so it was a real small game too. So the little countertop things that uh, really, really neat little things in the pharmacy and the world. You like to talk about values? What would yeah, price tag like on that. Price tag on that. Uh, all the early 30 ones and things, probably anywhere from three to three to four hundred bucks. All these things are going for you. Really? Uh, Ballyhoo and Baffle Ball at times would bring close to six, just because they were a famous one. But they were, uh, you can find them all day long for for that. Uh, I, I'm not going to say you any of mine. Well, I have some of mine I'll say you back. I've got lots of people to work on them and things. But, but yeah, they're, they're doing them. Most people don't find them interesting to play to do it, but I, I find them you can set and challenge people with these little games and be entertained for, for hours. Right. Uh, Dan, tell us about the red area in the lower right. Okay. The red area is really the, is the tilt. And, uh, Actually, they had pinball out on location for about a year before they came up with a tilt mechanism. <laughs> and uh, what that is is a not a good picture of it, but it's it's just a, a round bowl with a little bar in the middle of it, and you there's a ball sitting on top of it. And when you reset it, the, that bar goes down and then pops back up, and the ball is balanced on that little rod. If you shake it too much, then the ball would fall off the rod, and you tilted the game. So. Since these are all for amusement only, the only reason they needed that was that if, if you were gambling on it or paying off, you didn't know where doing it. So the usual wasn't on the game, but the stores would have a chart behind there or they'd tell people, well, you get over this store, you win a beer or a dollar or cigarettes or cigars, whatever. But the operator, if you got a high score, you'd bring them over and say, Hey, uh, I won, you pay me. But if the ball was off that circle, whoops, you don't get paid. <laughs> so that's why, I mean, the tilt, the only reason the tilt was put there is because of gambling. It didn't, you could still play that whole game, it didn't do anything, it just because if you tried to get payoff for it, they know you tilted it. Otherwise, why would they care? So it was all just, it was strictly for. <laughs> Keep people from getting them. Were there were there any electronics in this one, or is this too early for it? This is all. These are all, all the ones you've seen so far have been all mechanical. All right. uh, and supposedly the, the inner thing about tilt, the, the name tilt was that uh, 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 I think it was it was Williams was out because he worked in California for Pacific Amusement before he farmed Williams in '47. But he was at a bar somewhere, and a guy a, a player was playing. And knocked, uh, did something, and said the word tilt. So supposedly it came from a player instead of anybody in the company, in the business. But, so why is Chicago the hot bag? Uh, well, I, because it was just the, the distributing capital of the U.S. at the time. Just where it happened to be. I mean, well, everything got shipped out of there. Chicago was the Manufacturing center, central location for getting everything. Sears robot there. Yeah, everybody was there. And I said, at the time it was probably because a lot of raw material was there from all, and transportation to get them there was from the, along the Great Lakes. They'd give them in, and that's where the thing was made. On Chicago and Detroit and all that area. And now, why? Uh, actually, in the early thirties. Pinball machines was made all over the U.S. Uh, and of course, that wasn't much to make them. You, if you could, anybody who did carpenter work, they could have, drive a few nails with a pin and hammer. You know, you, you could make a pinball machine. So they were made all over the place. Uh, say uh, Williams actually worked for a company called Pacific Amusement that was out of California, but eventually they moved to uh, Chicago and. Uh, Got an office there just because that seemed to be all of a sudden that was the hub or that's uh, where Gottlieb's got started and then uh, Valley, Ginkgo and all of them, they all was, was there for, for what reason, but I, I'm not sure 
only reason I ever read was it because that's just where all the manufacturing was done. That was a simple point at the time. <clears throat> so next, let's see what next one. And they made them in all different kinds of shapes. This is a square one from the the thirties called Daisy, and the, the play field is, is round. You shoot the ball, and it just circles around the play field, but it also slopes towards the middle. So you the ball the deal is to the ball comes around here and you circle and you want it catches on all these things but you want to get it there to the to the picture one well they made several kind of those I don't know if I have I think somebody knows them I know that one Beacon was another one made it was kind of unique in the fact that it was a multi level you have three separate play fields and you had to do a, like a two or three step process to get the balls in three separate or two holes and then hit a third one to get the balls in the other play field. So it was logic, how deep was a pinball machine? We talk about how deep they were and they made them, even had that same concept back there to make them more level and just falling into one ball or one for you. That's where multi balls came from. Uh, yeah. Not really. But, uh, Next, and uh, Manka Ball is one of my favorite. Just uh, is that, but I always enjoy the shooters down here. They have a little protractor, and you sit there and aim your shots, and then shoot it, and it bounces around. But always, just, uh, actually, I was a draftsman for a while, so I like all this art drawing and stuff, and having a protractor on there. It's kind of neat. But. And that's uh, that's all of these are. 32, 33, so far. Next. Uh, yeah, somebody else this one. Uh, it's called uh, hmm? Spot Ball. Spot Ball. And uh, it's just all the neat uh, metal and <laughs> artwork and all these things. To me, it's still amazing. I like the stone work. It's pretty. Next, here's another round one, but it's a typical play field. The play field level is slopes from top to bottom, but it's still a square pinball machine with a round play field. So. Seven sock shots from Penny. Oh, back up on that. Uh, one called roller ball. Actually, you circle around and layer on it, and uh, do a circle eight. But also, it had things where the two-step thing. You had to get a ball up here, and it made this lever go up and then you could get a ball in the hole that that lever was protecting. So you had a, a two-step process to get a higher score. And baffle ball, people talk about uh, home games as just something new. Well, back in 1932 with baffle ball, they made home models of games for people. And they were, I guess they were cheaper, they didn't put a corn op on them, a corn back on them, so that was, but the home, thing about games in homes are, been around for <laughs> prayer. Or just stay down. Mm. Next. And they had two player games. Mm. These are actually more famous. Uh, they were made by a company in Beaumont, Texas. And this supposedly Texas was the hotbed for two player games. Uh, I have no idea why. Uh, well, Texas and then also the most famous one called Jack and Jill was made by a company, a company in California. But uh, when you push it in, it reset both both play fields. You had two two play fields on here. It's, they were completely separate. And after you shot it, all the balls reset. And this one had a plunger on this side. He fed all these balls in and shot them. This one had a plunger on that side and he shot them. And you could just challenge the opposite player. Both. I don't know why. I don't know if you both be trying to play at the same time or. You know, or one sheet's and I'll do it, but it's uh, these are being built in spite of the depression. Yes, Maybe. I, I think because of it. <laughs> Gambling this was the way they made easy money. That was a big sales point. A lot of these sold for a grand total. You can see all the ads. They were like a grand total of seventeen ninety six or nineteen twenty four fifty two. All that, and uh, they'd come out and do it. 
And this is another one from 33 uh, called Hooper Doo. And I always thought it was if you ever see a baffle ball, it has the same layout and the same vivid colors on it, except this one has them in circles and Ballyhoo has them in, uh, I guess, the squares. They're more diagonal lines across the play field. So are, are Pachinko machines related to these at all? I mean, was there like a, a split genetically at some point uh, that you end up with Pachinko machines? Well, the uh, well, all of, I really don't know. All I've heard is that really Pachinko became famous from uh, more from uh, get me back up a little bit. The history of, of pinball machines. Both they started out as something called bag of tails, which is kind of look like this, but there's no corn op. You just shot a ball and it bounced around that, and they made them from countertop size up to pool table size. There's a famous picture of Abraham Lincoln playing a bagatelle oh, wow. uh, back in that. Uh, and both of the bagatelle got the name from a guy in France uh, who liked to gamble. So he, his name of his castle or grounds was bagatelle or something by that area. So that's how they, he, all these games got developed. And they migrated to the U.S. Uh, Pachinko games both came about from, and pinball was here in the, in the U.S. mainly for that, but from the event of World War One and World War Two, after our troops were stationed overseas, the U.S.O. took pinball machines back to, over there for them to play, and they started propagating the, the those locations. So, I mean, and, and that's how, and, and then. The photo the version of Pachinko games is they kind of inverted these up, made them vertical and that's more the roots. They had less for the room. This is really a weird one called Matches Score. Uh, you shoot the ball and it makes those circles and falls into certain holes and they come down in the little slots. What's unusual about it, to shoot the ball, actually, it, you push your plunger in, but that plunger pushes a uh, air valve. A, a bulb inside, and it's like squeezing the bulb like you would a, a, turkey, baster. a turkey baster or something like that. And that pressure supposed to shoots the ball around. And I'm still playing on trying to come up with a good turkey blaster <laughs> <laughs> to shoot the ball. I, I don't. I think I'm missing some parts off of it. I can't get it to work. So one of these days I'll go back and look at it. And this is the one called Contact 1934, and it's the first pinball machines with electricity on it. It had a little kick-out hole and a bell. All those, all those others we've seen, they had say, no electricity. That and, uh, and what it was, if you had, we want to do here, you want to get the, your ball in again. It was a two-step process: get a ball in here, and then land there, and that would kick out. The ball would kick out, and it would roll down there, and get higher scores below. That layout. So again, it was a. How much do you think that one was? Like the price still up because of electric? Uh, that one's still probably four hundred bucks. Now, what do you think originally? Though? Originally. Hmm? Thirty bucks. Oh, uh, originally sold for yeah, probably about thirty bucks, somewhere in there. Probably. I mean, you got to realize this was all during the depression, and thirty bucks was a lot of money. People worked all day for a dime. Five million dollars. <laughs> you know, so how much do you work? What do you get paid for a day and multiply that? And you see, you know, it makes quite a bit of difference. So, and this is again 1934. Both of the contact and this was made by Pacific Amusement. Not the norm, but this is added electronic. This is one of my favorite games yeah. uh, called Major League. And you play it, you actually, the balls go around. You play a baseball game, you try to get. And they'll, they'll hit certain holes up there, this ball here, or run the base for you. And you get a home run. You go up here, points are in the hundreds. You get down here, you get 3,000s. That's where the big points are, so you want to do it. And they have, again, they have a little payout schedule here. If you have so many home runs or points, you would, you get so many other points back. I just say points, you win points. But again, they, they convert those points to <laughs> something. But then, again, this is a tilt mechanism. You probably can't see it, there's a little hole right here, and you know that shines down, and they would show above the corn neck to see if you put in a slug or not. 
Well, I actually, some of them, uh, coin match, you could, uh, it was variable. You could play a quarter or a dime, a nickel or a penny, and they, they would see what, what you bet to know how to pay you off. So, uh, and this is the famous bumper, the first one with bumpers. And again, all of them are just uh, single-sided. I mean, uh, they're called uh, no pop bumpers to them. They use the indicator bumper. You hit them and it's scored. And I always think he's interesting because that bumper is a round wire, and that wire goes down, set in a little ring, and that's the contacts. And it's neat to play this game with the lights off, and you can see all these sparks hitting on these wires going through there. And a lot of times to restore them, you've got to rebuild that wire because it's hit so much, the spark has slowly cut it in half. And uh, this is a one called Formation. It was made in 1940. Still no flippers yet. And there are all those are, <clears throat> not those even pop, pop bumpers either. They all use indicator bumpers. But uh, and it's, this was the second game I ever got, so uh, it was fun. But uh, you had to, to light up the bumper, you had to hit one first, and then one was lit, and you'd hit two, one and two lit, and turn on three, and go all the way down to seven. Of course, you can't sit on here, but they have a nice little post on the back side of four and seven, so it's kind of, you can't run down the stream, you have to shoot and go over it, so it's, it's very tough to do. And a lot of these are, uh, you don't have the, Playability of the flippers or of shots and things, but there's still a lot of logic and uh, challenge. and challenge. I guess some more challenge to try to get them all done to hit them and do them. But then it's all off the plunger shot. Which way you shoot it, where it bounces, or which side you want to run down. And this is just a oh, I stuck this one. This one I just got called Paradise. So I uh, threw it in here, and that's just the backlash of it. Uh, go ahead, hit next. And some of the back glasses then happened to be hand painted, or was there a, a you know if there was a mechanical process? I, th I still think like it was all art screen back here. Okay. Uh, they had uh, most of the, the companies I actually in Chicago, and they, most of them used the same art company to do the glasses, but they would have Pacific artists working for them. I guess they was all contracted out most of it. Uh, I can't think of it company's name right now but uh, I was uh, that that last one had a lot of color to it yeah. and, and if, it, if it were uh, if it were done uh, using a like a yeah. silk screen process or what I can equate it to it it take it it's more work every time you do a color that's that right more, they, more. some of them like you said they used to have a 13 color print screen on these things and that was almost normal I don't, and nowadays you're probably lucky to get by with four, four right so, I always thought that was kind of uh, some things that help not a bit. And this is just a play field. This is a United game. It's uh, uh, not much to it, but uh, this, I don't know if you can see it, but this is one that has flippers. The deal is, if you look at it, it'd be hard to find the flippers. You see any flippers on the wall? The flipper is. It's right there. And, uh, of course, they came out with flippers in 47 on the first one was Humpty Dumpty, and it had six flippers on it. All of them were down both all the sides just to kind of keep the ball in the middle because that's where all the bumpers were at. So that's how they kind of got started that. So that they played with and experimented with flippers quite a bit. A lot of games got retrofitted with flippers. Just because they were, they were already produced, as soon as flippers came out, everybody wanted to play the new game with flippers. So they actually, I, don't know, I, don't know, I guess they're, I don't know that Bally or William did it, but there was flipper kits you could buy, and they were advertised in the, the trade magazines. So here is a flipper kit, you can add flippers to your game. So, so that, and you can find old games that they'll say no flippers, and there'll be flippers on them, but they'll no tell them where they'll be at, because some operator or distributor just, Drill holes and put them in. So now you had flippers. But this one was probably uh, planned. Hit the next one. Let's see if we can 
Uh, you can see it has flippers down there. Control kickers. That's, yeah, they call them control kickers instead of flippers. They just send a. It's just, uh, well, hit the next one. Next. Oh, that's okay. Oh, hit another one. Hunter Blur. But there's the flipper. Now you just hit the next one. All it does is. I'll move it. You move. It just moves a little bit. Right. It moves the same way as a regular flipper. It just put it on one end. That's uh, a little weird. <coughs> not much to it. And a lot of them that had their early flippers or what? The flipper play would not be the. <laughs> There's nothing like it is today. Next. I thought this was needed to dry. dry. The grain of this, there's these posts here, and they look like they have spaces for three rubber layers. And I can't figure out why they would have three separate <laughs> strands there for for the rubbers. But, uh, and this is one I thought was really neat. To, uh, hit the next, hit the next one. I just put this one together to take pictures of it, and I opened up the back box, and I, I think I counted one, two, three, and then four. Electrical <laughs> cords. <laughs> <laughs> why what, what is it? Is that, would that be standard? I'm ready, to, I'm ready to go plug one of them in, right? Yeah, yeah, like yeah. Say, you need to look at all this stuff before you do it. I don't, that it turns out this one here was is just loose. It's been cut. I don't know what it went to, but this one plug here and then another wire up there plug. So the early I'll have to go through it. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't figure out. I don't know what everybody is. It's fun looking at these old games to try to figure out what other people have done to them. That's one of the big challenges. And that's my couple of that's kind of how I got into it. I like working on things, tearing it apart, hopefully putting it back together, but, uh, and trying to figure out what makes it tick. So I really enjoy the older games more than the new ones. The new ones you, know, you got all this information about it. And go read a book and it tells you all the parts and all this other stuff. But game from here. Well, and it's funny, uh, United, you can't even find a schematic for them from the 50s game for their pinball games. They made United do famous for and Midway for making shuffle bowlers and other games, and they did schematics for all those, and those are really available. But nobody has a schematic for a United pinball machine in the 50s that I could have been able to find. Pinball <coughs> source. Uh, this is another famous game, I, I, or not game, famous game for say, but another one of my games I really like, and it has flippers, Sally, in 1948. <clears throat> but the flippers are down here and they're backwards to what they are. But they have a pretty good, they're pretty strong, you know, knock the ball back up the top of the play field, and it's a fun, really fun game to play. Again, the targets is, it has six, tor 10 targets on it, you try to have to turn out the lights in sequence. These barely have a, a, a pitch to it, the very flat, like the no, 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 they're about the same as okay. the regular ones. Well, there's other flippers on there on, on the Sally, but they say they work just swing backwards. Uh, kind of neat. This exhibit Circus is another one on here, and that's just that's the backlash. Uh, it's uh, again from 1948. So that was a Chicago coin machinery. How many, at its peak, how many op manufacturers were there in Chicago then? Uh, I think in, uh, before the war, in that, uh, there was probably, I don't know, I've heard, I've heard totals up to 300 different companies making them. They all weren't, they weren't all in Chicago at the time. After the war, it kind of centralized Chicago, and there the the big ones were King, uh, there's probably about ten of them: Kinkos, Exhibit, uh, United, and Bally, and Yachtlip. Let's see what who is others. One Chicago coin. Well, and I think Ginko may have became Chicago coin. Into that, and I don't know if that's on there, but there's probably about 10 of them that were making them up there that made a, quite a few runs. And you look at the uh, history of pinball, you'll see the manufacturers, there are quite a few of them in there. But right before, uh, so when they finally went to electronics and got flippers and things, it kind of centralized. The, the, there was a, mostly coming out of Chicago and, and 
So the manufacturers went down from 100 to 10 or so in Chicago that were really doing them. Once, once a little bit of the, I guess, complexity got into it, mom and pop couldn't make them you know, competitive out in, in Beaumont, Texas anymore. Pound them with the hammer, but he didn't know. <laughs> Hard to do. Well, this uh, this one right one. You go on to the next one. This is that same that, but this is a kicker bumper. And if you see, if the ball hits this, if like a the plate on a bumper hits this, this will kick. It kicks one way. It will just kick this way and do it. And I thought this was kind of neat. In the fact that this was 1948. And that's the advent of a pop bumper. But you really didn't see pop bumpers come alive on other machines for really about mid 50s. For another eight years before pop bumpers really came about. But they was part of what the later thing in the 90s of a, an automatic flipper. Well, this was an automatic flipper. It hit that and it kicked the ball. It just flipped it. It is a little weird. This is another one I just picked up and, uh, called Double Action. And this is the back glass, and uh, the whole back glass is just what we would call a bag of tail machine or a pachinko game almost. The ball over here feeds up and kicks out, and bounces, you don't know, you can see them all the pin, and then hit one of the scoring holes at the bottom. And as you're playing the game, hit, you can go ahead and hit the plate for hit next, that's it. Well, you can see that's the ball at the bottom, more of the scoring. But as you're going through playing it, as you get certain targets on the play field, I don't know if I'm here, uh, it will advance the ball. Or if you go in one of the their kick out holes, the play field, the ball on the, on the play field stays in that hole and it, it automatically feeds one all the way around for the, the back glass. So this, you had a back glass play field back in 1951. The next one was what, what one's I run back in. <laughs> In the 80s. Yeah. Uh, Williams Casanova. Yeah. 64 or something. Yeah, there's more. A lot of them had smaller bag of tails on the back glass. Again, these flippers are there, a little backwards. But they still have a nice kick to them. You know, they'll kick the ball back up to play fit. I have a question about that Because so if you get the button, any button controls both flippers at the same time on that one. Is that true of the earlier game? Uh, with or no? Not of all of them, but that was a common thing. A lot of getting the game, one button control operated all the flippers. Because it was one co solenoid coil pulled the flippers in. So it, and it pulled both of them in. So you didn't have a left and you had buttons on left and right, but no matter which one you hit, both flippers went. So they shared linkage? Yeah, and they shared linkage on that. I don't know if that was a money-saving thing for them at that time, or just the way some of them did it. That was the design they had. And uh, that kind of famous game is Balls of Popping. It was the first, I guess, planned multi-ball. And uh, we played it. It's, uh, as you play, you hit targets, and it would you'd count up and, and win the wall balls. You know, one day you went up to six of them, and uh, and you'd have a ball on the play field, so you could get seven balls going at a, a time. But when you if you hit a certain hole after that, it kicked out those, that number of balls out on the play field. And it's uh, the play field action on that. I've never gotten it to be very lively, so it, it's it's still kind of. And the flippers just don't seem to do it. And contest is one of again another one had it's kind of neat. It's kind of, oh, all half of these games are gone now. No, they really don't get a lot of fun. I've changed my up and lane. But this is a neat thing. It, it was kind of famous because it's one of the first ones that actually had people playing pinball on the back glass. <laughs> So there's a few, and there's just a few games that actually predicted pinball machines on the back line. So I guess we won the first one that did that, and uh, actually, and so we hit the play the next one, the play field. The play field on the, the main thing here, of course, it has the, the famous 
got a little roto -tor roto target in it, but it has that same group of people playing pinball on it. And that's not plastic, that's actually a piece of metal there that's printed on it. And it has uh, the famous things that ever do it. These two things here are called gobble hose, and they're called gobble hose. When you go down it, you lose the ball, it drains. <laughs> Uh, and at times they were made that you wanted to do that because they'd build up to the, the big points. And you'd win hundreds of points instead of uh, 10 or so. They uh, were called Jalopy and it's a neat, they did a lot of back glass animation where you'd play and get the cars to move across. It's just some famous artwork and Gusher. Gusher's kind of a famous one. Always loved the artwork on the back glass. Uh, but it's famous because it has a disappearing bumper, which uh, if you hit certain things, this, this bumper right here goes up and down in the play field. Uh, like a uh, circus poker. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And this is a bingo game, and again, you would play to get it, and just you're playing bingo as your ball landed in the play field, certain holes in the play field. You try to get those, hopefully you hit those numbers and make a rolling thing. Right? This one was a uh, high class one because you know, I think you could normally this was a dime and you could play up to the three dimes on this one. You could shift all these numbers. One, there's another set of numbers on on this side and on that side. So you shift could shift it left and right and change your numbers to see if any of the others match. It's a is it a magic square? Well, it's uh, it, it's kind of like I mean yeah, you, you're trying to get those and they had all the other kind of little betting thing. They were all gambling yeah. games. They were just straight the gambling games. Some of them had payout mechanism on them. Uh, this one, I guess one has a little counter right here. How many points you win. Credits. And so you, uh, get your beer. you get credits. And you get so many, you got finished, you would ask the operator to come over and he'd give you that much credits for whatever. And I suppose they had a, most of them had a little button in the back the operator could push to reset that. And then it became illegal for uh, for any game that had that reset button where you could reset the score outside the game, uh, outside the coin back, was illegal. And they couldn't ship it across state lines. So like with, uh, I was thinking, maybe that would be a resurrection for uh, football, if they allowed it in, in like Indian casinos, like they yeah. have payback on it. <laughs> oh, I'm sure they would, they would like it. Uh, Bitch Queen is another one, again, it has a credit wheel somewhere on it. But it's a, uh, it's called a one ball. And you shot, shot one ball, and you hit the plus the next one. See, what? Well, no, no, maybe I don't have to play for. That's not. That's not me. That's not. That's King of Diamonds. Huh? There might be a one more. Maybe I stuck one in there. No, that's Oklahoma. Maybe I don't have the uh, beach queen. But it's a one ball. It has yeah, has. Uh, nine bumpers on it. If you get all nine, you win, and it has one kick out hole where you get 10 and 11 on the play field. You got 10 and 11, it throws the ball out. You get that kick out hole. It done, it's aimed to go straight down the middle of the drain. So, uh, it's very hard to win all these games. If you did a odds for winning on all of them, you would you would want to play. There were, there were a lot worse odds than what you get in Vegas right now on slot machine. There, some of them are really terrible. Some other famous games, Flipper, or this the first one. It was the first add a ball. And the big boy. There's no out lanes. How about that? I'm sure the ball machine with no out lanes. With that gap between those slippers. <laughs> so what is add a ball? Add a ball. Well, uh. Instead of, as you're playing, instead of winning an extra ball, or well, you'd win an extra ball, you'll go back one. Uh, what it was, you'd start off with five balls at the bottom. If you could play, you'd win an extra ball. Instead of the next ball, it would add up his count, so it would keep how many balls. As you played, it would step down. So letting you win an extra ball. When they, I guess, got serious about this and made it illegal, started doing it. Uh, pinball got a bad hype on it, and there's gambling and all this stuff would do it, but then they said, oh no, it's a game of fun. But a lot of places they could not, you could, that was not the wrong one, hey? 
would not allow you to award a free game. You could not win a free game. Well, that was you were winning something. That was gambling and paying you back. But instead of a free game, they came up where you could win a free ball, which was still just playing the game a little longer. So back in the, the 50s and 60s, it became big to whether you could, you had replay states and add a ball states or extra balls states to where they could ship them to. So it was all, so that was a big deal and people, some people grew up just playing at a ball in what state she was in, that area, that's all you saw. Other people you saw replays. So it's uh, at, at this just, time, how much were these pins brand new? These pins, uh, three to four hundred dollars probably at that time. So inflation adjusted, I mean, what would that be? <laughs> <laughs> Four million. I have no idea. That was 1961. <laughs> not 8,500 bucks. Yeah, I, I have. <clears throat> I'm not an economist. <laughs> it's like the, mu the Mustang was like three or four thousand dollars back then. The 64 yeah. Mustang. Well, uh, oh, in 61, a Mustang you could get it for less than two thousand dollars. Okay. The car you could buy a nice car for less than two thousand dollars. I got a question, Dan. I notice the later we get on the pinballs, the, the tops are getting lower, the shorts are getting. You know what I mean? Is there is there a first like a controversial one maybe or a risque kind of or um, people complained about? Do you remember like the first? Owners. From day one. Oh, for real? Go back to all of them. Go back to uh, uh, just Sally and Queen of Hearts. And all of them. That was balls of popping. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, as soon as they started having back glass heart, but that, you know. Dan never complained about it. Yeah. <laughs> then, man, you know, the swimsuits right here, I mean, how, how risky is that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can see it now. <laughs> Hard to uh, and there's a neck. Yeah, there's a neck and ankles. Oh, jeez. Yeah, this is heat wave, it is all. It's one of them, a neat game, too. I like it. It's still there, but it's uh, just the artwork on it. It's really neat and cool. And you pull it out again and play it. Of course, this is one other thing came about the zipper flippers. This is from Fireball. The flippers actually go together and the, the ball won't drain. Uh, Except on that one. And this is one they have. Other, these are just a bunch of different features. They have a little roulette wheel on the, on the play field, and the ball goes around. You get certain targets that will spin, and wherever it lands, you get those points. That was, uh, and of course, looking for higher, smaller tops and things. Here's a good one, eight ball. Uh, electronic, black knife. These are just some of the games I have. That my favorite games. So. And Spectrum. Spectrum is really a, a neat game. In fact, it has no <laughs> pop bumpers, no outlane kickers. It's really a weird game. No plunger either, right? And no plunger, right? It's not a game. Astro and Annie, well, both Spectrum and Astro and Annie are very rare games. Spectrum supposedly they made about a thousand of them, but because it's so weird, nobody they didn't get the orders out. And the rumor is they, they destroyed over 500 of them sitting in the, at the factory. Why? What? Nobody would buy them. Wow. So, so they just, just and I'm not destroying them. I don't, you know, not tax. Most of the cabinets they would probably refurbish because there's the same like side cabinets, but I'm sure a lot of the play fields and stuff. I doubt they didn't pay anybody to restrip them back down. They, I'm sure they just trashed people. And this asteroid Andy was one. It was a, a electronic, but it was a single player game. And again, it didn't sell by then. Everybody was used to having four-player games. Uh, it didn't sell, and totally. But they, it was neat. Just uh, orders didn't come in on it. Suppose they only made about 300 of those. And then Hercules is another. They didn't make a whole lot of them because they weren't expecting to sell a whole bunch of these. But not too many places have them. But and I've seen anywhere from four to six hundred dollars. Not four to six hundred is how many were made on there, but somewhere not. I would playing that. Yeah. It was more of a promo. Yeah. One. Yeah. I, I think. I mean, uh, 
I think Hercules, I mean, that was Atari just trying to get into the pinball. I mean, they were there, but they hadn't made it. And I think they did that just as a... It was Atari V, though. Just to, to do something really different and get their name out as far as pinball. And and I think it helped because I well, they sold quite a few of them, but they went to malls and the, all the arcade centers, and but they set those outside in the big mall area, general public area, because they weren't really afraid of too many people running up and grabbing it and running away with it. <laughs> oh, they are. I guess you know, all it takes to be four strong guys, one on each leg, and to go out running. But, uh, of course, they ball you up. Of course, the weird, the smaller uh, back glass. And they made several of those. Well, back up on one. I mean, it's tough. But both of the story behind that area is that I don't know. The, they got one. They have a rapid fire in here or one of them. Yeah, one yeah. on there. Hyper ball. Yeah. Yeah. They made those and they had the smaller that. And they, they, they made so many cabinets. They, somebody screwed up, ordered too many cabinets. So they they just kept using the same cabinet until they used them up. You know? Yeah, I saw a Centaur. Yeah, Centaur, Centaur, two, Centaur 2 is like yeah. that. Oh, that's it. That's it. Yeah. yeah. They, they've done them at times just to. Not because it was famous or anything, but they were just business. They were using up extra inventory. I like it. And I say that I showed those uh, all those uh, extension accords coming out of that last game. One of the weirdest thing I ever seen in a pinball machine. Go hit the next slide here. A set of contact car contact points. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, nobody today knows what a points are from a distributor of a car, probably. But used to all our cars had. Uh, these little points in them as your distributor ran and cam turned that they would open and that would spark and fire your spark plugs. And I, I have no idea why this is in here. It, it's the, the bell coil is tied in through that. So I guess you could go in there and stick a piece of paper in there and turn it off. I don't know why they would have, wouldn't have used just a regular switch instead of <laughs> Yeah, it was closed. I mean, it was making a constant. It's always hot. Yeah. Until you, unless you went in and put something in between it. So, thank you, you don't do that. Well, when you just use a regular toggle yeah. switch, I have no Somebody idea. Looking around. Yes. And this is the last one. This is, ooh. Ooh. Yeah, That's a weird How do you spell it? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Daffy? Oh, this is Daffy. Uh, this is my game, one I worked on, and it's kind of neat. It only has one flipper on it. <laughs> And it has a horse horse racing horses in the back, but it's it's really a fun game to play. But it's it's kind of weird. It's really a fun game to play, but it's weird that only has one flipper on there on the on the wrong side, <laughs> and both buttons are working. Now that's a true gambling game there. Yeah. <laughs> on one, and uh, it basically awards games, and uh, the operator had actually taken the uh, position of the payout wheel and turned it like 180 degrees or something so that it would never pay out. <laughs> he was making all kind of money. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of a lot of the pinball machines used to have a payout mechanism in them and they'd sit there and kick out coins. Like, just like a block machine or a safe cracker will do today. I'm sorry, that was all that down. Have you found any cool welding kind of things uh, inside the machines when you open them up? Maybe or? like that. Uh, three dead rats and I know. <laughs> Jimmy Hoffa? No, not really. It's all kind of weird. I mean, it's more trash than anything else. No money? No, no money. Uh, you find a bag of money? I haven't ever found a bag of money in any of mine. Uh, earlier, Ken was talking about fuses, and things, but I have found where people take the fuse holder out and they'll just take the wire from one end and attach it to the other side. Uh, best one I found is somebody took a uh, Quarter inch bolt, and I never realized this, but a quarter inch bolt or that it's a perfect size of the fuse holder. All you gotta do is just pop it in there and you got a good strong fuse. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you call it. Chicago fire. <laughs> yeah. No, what, no uh, bullets? What kind of <laughs> 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 well, <laughs> bullets? But it would uh, it would do that. But yeah, you know, it's just just weird thing, huh? One of the fun things in my house is seeing how what damage other people have done when they work on these things. Well, that's all. I have any, any other questions? Hope it's nice. I do have this little handout. It goes a little bit about historical things of a pinball up through about 2000. We need to, somebody needs to go in and start adding from there. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan.